everyone. This is the continuous video of the analysis slash his, 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 history her story of the Vatui Harbinger with us. If you haven't already, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on the bell and go check out the previous video because if you just jumped into this video because of Skarmouche, you're going to be confused. And also, go check out my previous videos. And yeah, that's all I gotta say. Let me get out your faces. Also, have you drank water today? Mm. First off, we know that Scarmouche is a puppet made by a god, supposedly possessing powers similar to that of the Shogun puppet, and he's only the sixth strongest of the Harbingers. That is a terrifying prospect. That means there are several non-god-like entities that are stronger than this See, that also makes me nervous about his kid because he is one of the most anticipated characters of Genshin Impact and that makes me very nervous for his kid. Now this is just predictions that she has. This is not the actual just, you know, he could be the most powerful character in Genshin Impact, lining up with John Lee, Ganyu, Raiden Shogun, the Santa Third, whoever you pick on the list as the strongest. But I don't want to put too much faith in Hoyo first, but I just expect the worst. Because also look at Yamiko the most anticipated character, and now look her kid. God puppet. That's crazy. Second, no one seems surprised or upset that Scaramouche is absent. Capitano makes it sound as though his disappearance was almost planned, or at least accounted for. Dottori talks about Scaramouche receiving the divine gaze, which kind of implies that the whole reason Scaramouche was even involved in the events of Inazuma, or the Harbingers at all, was because he possesses a unique capacity to understand something crucial about the Gnosis. If it wasn't something unique to him, then any of the other Harbingers would have been able to do this with the two Gnosis that they already have. But they don't. They send him deliberately to get the Electro Gnosis, which was supposed to be his to begin with. Now, Child thus far is the one that's been sent after Scaramouche, and it is possible, based on his wording, that he is not the only one with this assignment. The Harbingers are waiting for the correct moment. So I wonder if the Gnosis, once activated, almost functions like a beacon. Like if Scaramouche does not conquer the Divine Gaze, then he cannot be tracked, but the moment he accomplishes it, they could find him almost immediately. But on the topic of the Gnosis, but also kind of unrelated, it is fascinating to me that the Saritza doesn't have the Gnosis. Piero does. And that he's using them all as literal chess pieces on the board. The nice thing about this is that we can confirm 100% without a doubt that Venti is the queen piece and not the king, because there was some room for doubt about that, even if it was kind of unlikely. And we can also speculate about which chess piece actually belongs to the Electro Archon. But to do that, we need to talk about so what do they want with Venti? If he's the one of the key pieces, what kind of information are y'all trying to get out of him? Something to do with monster? Don't when did y'all use child for that since he's technically playing both sides? Well, mm. The actual chessboard layout. The game board might seem random, but it is actually a historic game. It is Game 1, Move 34 of Deep Blue vs. Gary Kasparov, 1996. For non chess nerds, this game was the first in a series of games between a computer AI and a chess master, wherein the AI won for the very first time. Now note that Deep Blue, the AI, was white while Kasparov, the chess master, was black in this game. On the chessboard, the Fatui are black, and I guess Celestia is white. We know this because Senora's Hellfire Butterfly lands on a fallen black pawn that gets captured by a white knight. This means that in this game, Senora was the pawn and the white knight was the shogun puppet that killed her. 
What's fascinating here, though, is that Celestia is in the position of Deep Blue, the computer AI. That means the Fatui are actually representing humanity. This is a very interesting take, given that Piero is in fact confirmed Conrian now. And through Dane's Lift, we learned that Conria was a nation without gods and it had no need of gods. This implies that Conria put immense value on the power of humans. But in this first game of chess, the side representing humanity loses. There's a couple of weird things about this game board, though. By now, you've probably seen the theory on Reddit by Jin Dice claiming that, due to positioning, Venti's Gnosis is actually a king piece and not a queen piece as originally speculated. And if you're looking at this positioning on the board and comparing it to game one move 34 of Deep Blue versus Kasparov, you'd be right. However, all the pieces on the board are from a standardized Staunton chess set, which makes the two pieces in the middle of the board kings and not queens. Meaning, Venti's Gnosis is actually a queen piece, but it is in the position that the king should have been if referencing game one move 34. So... Either Mihoyo made a boo-boo, or the roles of the king and queen piece in the game have been switched. Pierre? Well, Hoyo first made a boo-boo, because they can barely play their own game. You can tell by the story quests and the builds. As far as Kaz was. Which I'm still hot about. But this is not the video or the time. Piero also makes this comment that the game does not end with checkmate. What I think he means is that there are more games to play. Deep Blue and Kasparov have six total games. Deep Blue only won once, Kasparov won three times, and there were two draws. It's quite possible that Scaramouche is a pawn on this board, and they're expecting him to reach the other side and promote into a knight to match the Electronosis before game two begins. But there is a bit of a problem with associating each chess piece to so they're playing. Okay, 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 okay. How do I break this down in a way where it doesn't look like I've been seeing outside sources? Let's say this. Um, so they're planning on basically La Signoring Scarmouche. Yeah, take a moment. Digest. They're planning, so they're basically planning on doing the same thing they did with Lost in Order to Scarmouche. Which is why he was. Mmm. That explains why he wasn't there. Because you can't mysteriously just be busy. Oh, there's the foot two, he's just meeting out. You know, let me just. Let me, I got some other things to do. No, 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 no. Especially if it was planned, that meeting was going to go left to either an Archon or a Harbinger, namely with the numbers. See, there are 11 Harbingers plus the Saritza for 12, but there are 16 pieces per side on the board. That's four pieces in one color unaccounted for unless they're represented by agents that are not Harbingers. This is a mystery I can't solve or even theorize about right now. I just lack information. But it does raise some serious questions about what Piero is actually trying to accomplish. So let's talk about Piero a little bit. Let's start with Comedia's Piero, a sad, pining clown dressed in white from head to toe. That at least suits the aesthetics of the Harbinger Piero, but Comedia's Piero is clumsy, a bit dim, and a victim of pranks very frequently. Harbinger Piero. This is a random thought, but he gotta be the most cleanest jester I ever seen since the Joker. Fight me, that's all I gotta say. Piero, by contrast, is a boss, calm, serious, and in complete control of everything. This is emphasized by how unfazed he is by the death of Senora and how certain he is that he will still accomplish his goals without her. As for who he is, well, okay. It's been long theorized that Piero was from Conria due to the way his artifact, the Mocking Mask, is worded. And now I'm happy to announce that we, if we just, you know, zoom in a little here, enhance and increase the contrast, and bada boom! He's got the primo gem eyes, just like Dainsliff, Kaya, and Halfdan. This dude is 100% bonafide Conrian. Now the most popular... 
I didn't even pay attention to that part. The dance, Kaya. Well, it's kind of hard to see with him, especially first glance, watching the Caesar and getting amped up on how far the animation is. You're really not going to peep that as well. But with Dainsif and Kaya, I, I forgot the person that was at the like, very bottom. But I never noticed that. And I played with Kaya on my favorite play players, too, and I never zoomed in on his eyes. Roles without her. As for who he is, well, okay. It's been long theorized that Piero was from Conria due to the way his artifact, the Mocking Mask, is worded. And now I'm happy to announce that we, if we just, you know, zoom in a little here, enhance and increase the contrast, and bada boom! He's got the Primo Gem eyes, just like Dainsliff, Kaya, and Halfdan. This dude is 100% bona fide Conrian. Now, the most popular theory out there right now is that Piero is Kaya's father. And I have to disagree. While it is absolutely impossible to ignore the similarities within their design, which we will cover in a minute, there's actually another possibility that makes more sense to me. Piero might be Kaya's grandfather. Yeah, the same pirate grandfather that Kaya supposedly inherited. Does that also make him Dilu's grandfather as well? Because ain't. Mm, maybe that's the stretch, because we don't know if they're actually. I mean, D. Luke has a whole new set. He has like a puppy dog type of eyes. Yeah, there could be a stretch because I don't even know if Kaya and D. Luke are even related. Hmm, that's a stretch. Inherited his eye patch from. In fact, what Kaya actually says is Look at my eye patch. I inherited it from my grandfather, and this is solid proof that we are related by blood. This is no different from children inheriting their hairstyles from their- This must be in Chapter 1, Act 30. That's why I haven't gotten to this part. Parents. Which I know sounds like a throwaway line, but here's the thing. Kaya has this light whitish streak in his hair, like it's just starting to turn white. Piero has a dark blue streak in his white hair. Now, in Kaya's story quest, he sends us on a treasure hunt. But it's mostly a ruse so he can catch some treasure hoarders, but the things he says during it are really strange. Look, I know Deluc says that Kaya tells lies, but it is my firm belief that Kaya doesn't lie. He just spins the truth in such a way that no one actually believes him because it sounds so crazy. And- Baby, that is a lie. <laughs> I don't know who taught you the definition of a lie, but that is a lie. If you have to spin the narrative, that is a lie. Can we get Mari in here? Like... This sword he keeps talking about. The one supposedly hidden in the Arcadian ruins. Well, Arcadia is a mythical place in Greek mythology, which wouldn't be significant except for the fact that the first unified civilization of Tavat that was ruled by the Primordial One is based on ancient Greece. And at the end of this quest, while he admits to there being no treasure in this location, he gives us a harbinger of the dawn as a reward. Now consider that Kaya was left at the dawn winery by his father when he was a child. And Kaya knew that he was considered a pawn of Conria, which is a really deliberate word choice that is somehow only found in the Chinese version, as far as I know. I'm sorry, I still can't get over the fact that he thought it was cute to give us a three-star uh, sword as a reward. Kaya, you don't have to fight me. But all these visual connections and thinking of himself as a pawn, and then there's Piero playing a game of chess? I mean, even their clothing is similar, from the fur trim to the style of lapels, similar earrings, and even the skin tone is the same, which is huge for a game that's 99% pale skinned, you know? There's no way they're not connected. And I don't think they're father and son, because the timeline doesn't really add up for reasons I don't have time to explain today, but I made a whole video on it if you're interested. There's also another really popular theory that's been around since the very beginning of the game, like since I might watch that video because I need to know the, I think Kaya and D. Luke are just friends, but I need to see their, like, 
history on how they came about. I feel like they touch, Hoyoverse touch on it, let's say, within a previous event and a previous Archon quest, but we didn't, it, oh, especially the very beginning. Chapter 1, Act 1, I think they touched on it. But in the quest, it was like two patches ago, this drink quest. I mean, event, not quest, but it was, you, you get to just. I think they kind of teased it again, and that was like pretty much it. But I might check that video out. Since launch, that if true, and seems like it actually is a very, very, very good chance of being true, would completely refute the idea that, you know, Piero is Kaya's father. And that is the whole Kaya is a prince of Conria theory. Now, this isn't as crazy a theory as it sounds at first. Because, like, his constellation is a peacock, and peacocks are usually associated with royalty. His constellation 1 is called Excellent Blood, or Excellent Lineage, indicating an important bloodline, which is what a royal would have. Plus, his normal attacks are actually called Ceremonial Blade Work, while every other knight of Favonius has Favonius Blade Work instead. Plus, if he's really that important of a piece of survival for Conria, as his father seems to imply when he leaves him at the winery, then Kaya has to be important on some level. He can't just be a random kid. Now, if this theory ends up being true, most would just say, oh, Piero must have been the king of Conria, but that actually can't happen. We know for a fact that Piero is not of royal blood. In The Mocking Mask, he says he failed to earn the favor of the previous ruler because his wisdom wasn't thought to be as valuable as the sages. This makes him sound more like some kind of royal advisor, since he was at least in contact with the royal family, so he had to be important to some degree, right? Or at least, you know, famous. So consider the possibility that Piero was quite literally a royal advisor whose son had married into the royal family. This would allow for the Prince Kaya theory to persist without Piero being a royal himself and still having them be related. And since there was already another ruler on the throne, Kaya's father would have been a prince rather than a king. I also don't think Piero could be Kaya's father because if he was Kaya's father, then he would know where Kaya was. He would be in Mondstadt, which would mean that Piero and Kaya would probably be in contact with each other and that would mean Kaya is also a secret agent of the Fatui. I don't buy this, even if it is kind of a tempting theory. If Kaya was a secret agent of the Fatui, he would have been very well aware of what Kole was experiencing in the manga, but he wasn't. He also wouldn't have had the incentive to use such dirty tactics against the Fatui in the manga either, but he did. He also wouldn't have had tried to stick the Fatui with a massive food bill during the Tanuki event out of spite, but he did. If Piero were in direct contact, I'm pretty sure those things just wouldn't have happened, or they would have happened very differently. Of course, this is just my opinion, so that's really all I'm going to say on this, but I kind of have one other thing that's kind of bothering me about Piero that I want to talk about. Since he's confirmed to be Conrian now, that means we have two antagonistic organizations that are now associated with the leaders of Conria. So the real question I have is, why aren't they working together? And the answer to this question is why I think Piero is Kaya's grandfather and not his father. So let me explain that idea. As I mentioned several times already, Kaya's father left him at the Dawn Winery and said, This is your chance. You are our last hope before he disappeared entirely. It's implied that the hour here is referring to Conria. Now, the Abyss Order wants to revive the homeland, which is speculated and heavily suggested to be Conria since the Abysslings are the former people of Conria, which makes that their homeland. It just makes sense. We're aware of two of their operations that they're going through to accomplish this. The first is the Loom of Fate operation, and the second is the removal of their curse. The Loom of Fate operation logically appears to be an attempt at seizing control of fate, time, or destiny and reweaving it, as Dainsleth puts it in Travail. To me, this sounds a lot like they want to rewind time and change the outcome of their last encounter with Celestia, maybe properly destroy them this time, seeing as Conria has no need for gods. Uh, basically, they want to restore what 
I wonder, are we ever going to see Celestia? Because I've, I've heard Celestia and what is the other one? Comria? Comria? I think that's the other one. Or it's Comria and Su Sumeru. I can't remember. But are we ever going to see that? Or is this like, I don't know, 4.0 from now? I'm going to tell you all about it what they once had. Kaya's unofficial title of Conria's Last Hope seems kind of appropriate for this purpose. But Piero and the Saritza are really keen on burning away the old world and creating something entirely new. Kaya can't really be the last hope of Conria if the plan is to destroy it. This only works if the new world is a new version of Conria, which seems kind of unlikely. Piero seems really disillusioned by what used to be Conria. I mean, they didn't listen to him at all, so it makes sense that he'd want to seize power from the Divine and remake the world to his liking. It's also worth mentioning that Piero doesn't seem to have any issue with the Divine. I thought he was working with the Tsaritsa as an equal partnership originally, but in the trailer, it kind of sounds like he reveres her, almost like a proper god or a queen. That also puts him at odds with the mindset of the Abyss Order, who do not respect the gods at all. Now what's interesting here is that Danesliff, a royal guard of Conria, doesn't seem to share the opinions of either the Abyss Order or Piero. Danesliff has no desire to fight the gods, and he has no intention. I really hope Hoyoverse takes this teaser into the next Archon Quest slash Sumeru and make the story about the Fatui. Maybe they're already gearing up to that, and I'm just, like, waiting. But I, this makes me more intrigued over the Vatui. Even though they're a pain to fight, especially if you, like, not equipped within weapons and artifacts, they're going to bully you. But this can open up a whole new type of discussion. When it comes to Genshin Impact. I mean, we, we never want to find answers off of the Traveler's Brothers. So I don't even want to hear that discussion. But the amount of history they bring. And amount of untalked about. Was little Easter egg. Little Easter eggs. Symbolism. And get your impact we never really notice. This can open up a lot. If we had our Archon conquest dedicated to the Fatui. Even though it's kind of weird saying. Especially investigating. Especially for the Traveler. Because they don't like the Traveler. But child likes Traveler. But it's just... It can bring a lot of things home. And also, I would love to see, like, back then, also, story of, like, how they came about, the Celestia, the Conrad, what they want to change, what happened in the past that they want to change within the future. Intention of revering them either. He's this weird middle ground between the two, which I think will be really important later on. But speaking of Danesliff, there's an interesting parallel to something he says in the travail about Sumeru, and something Piero says at the beginning of this teaser. The sages think themselves to be all-knowing, but we alone are wise to the virtue in those acts of folly. In the city of scholars, there is a push for folly, yet the god of wisdom makes no argument. Pause. Where did this come from? Is this the same game? Or is this from Han Hong Kong? Where, where is this teaser from? Where is he from? Now here's what's really interesting about Or was I not paying attention enough in the teaser? about this. In Sumeru, the highest ranking individuals are the sages, according to Hosieni. 
And Sumeru is the next stop on the traveler's journey. Now, Dottore is seen at the end of the teaser burning down an enormous tree, which is probably in Sumeru by the looks of things, and he calls it an experiment in blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is doing something offensive towards the divine, while folly is doing something foolish. And the Fatui are fools who see virtue in their folly. So what if the ones that are pushing for an act of folly in Sumeru are the Fatui? And the sages themselves may disagree with this act, but their Archon decides to let it happen anyway. If that's the case, I think we're going to be in for a wild ride come 3.0. But that's all I have to share for right now. This interlude teaser has spawned several new theory ideas in my head that I need way more time to process in order to make some more coherent theories, but uh, I'll, I'll be real with you guys. All I really want to do now is put Kaya, Dainsleaf, and Piero in one room and just shake them all until they spill out all their secrets. Just shake them all up. But hey, if you made it this far, thank you so friggin' much. You guys are awesome humans. But I... I'm sorry, it was like a weird car or shutter bus. I don't know, it was the most randomest noise I ever heard. But, um, what I was going to say before she, like, kind of logs out, do her intro, um, th I do agree. This can not only one, be one of the best Archon quests since Chapter 2, Act 1. Um, two, this could unpack a lot of history within Genshin Impact. And three, I would like to see it. Because <laughs> this in Sumeru is... Oh. Oh. This, this makes me really excited. And also seeing Sumeru... I don't know about the characters, but like, are, if these... The Fatui members are playable, plus the ones we, like, so-called intro. My, 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 we gon' we really go 3.0, we really finna get into some things. This is gonna be groundbreaking. This is. It, it really is going to unlock the... I feel like the true history of Genshin, but that may be a stretch, but that's my opinion. But if you like her, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'm going to let her finish her um, outro. Yeah, make sure y'all subscribe to her. I'm going to let her finish. I'm going to click off. I'm 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 gonna go and like take a week off and not talk to anybody like a good little hermit should, and uh, maybe I'll I'll take a nap. I'll catch you guys later. Her name is Asky Asky Asky. I don't know, but I'm subscribing, honey. I learned a whole lot. You should also subscribe to her and me as well. I hope you have a good afternoon, good night, good morning, whenever you're watching this. And also, have a good day. Stay hydrated. It's getting hot. Bye.